Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, May 5th. Welcome again to House Judiciary Committee. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties with, with YouTube. Um, however, it's important that we always have our, um, our meetings live streamed and, um, and we'll stop when, when the YouTube isn't working, but we are back live and we are now turning our attention to S7, which is a bill regarding expungement. And I've um, welcomed Jay Johnson, who is counsel to Governor Phil Scott. Um, Ms. Johnson and I have been having an ongoing conversation about S7. And um, I do have a number of our correspondents posted and I did hear, did hear from Attorney Johnson last night <laughs> um, with, some, uh, with some other concerns. And so I'm very glad that that you are here this morning to um, to talk to us directly, um, so we can really make sure that we under understand your con your concerns. So, so with that, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, Jay Pershing Johnson, the Governor's Counsel. Um, first, I I do appreciate the willingness of the committee to have this conversation, and I appreciate the changes that have been proposed to date. Um, and and I have appreciated the chairs. Um, help in engaging on this issue, which I, I think is important. Um, second, I do just, I wanna say that from my perspective, this is not a political partisan issue. Um, expungements and sealing, broadly speaking, are not necessarily a good thing or bad thing. Uh, in certain circumstances, they're a very good thing. And I think in certain circumstances, they can be a very bad thing. So what really matters is how we do this. Um, we, I think that you, we will probably hear from the commissioner that, that we have created a very complex and a very confusing system uh, that most Vermonters probably have no awareness of. Uh, and I would imagine probably most defendants have no awareness of. Um, but I think that, so, and this, this bill adds to that confusion. Um, I believe that that's not necessarily, um, that's not necessarily helpful, but uh, I understand that, that the committees are anxious to get something passed this year. And so we are anxious to work with you to help you do that. Um, of course, most people believe in second chances for certain crimes, certain crimes. As the AG recently noted in his recent Vermont Digger commentary, um, in order, I think, to assure Vermonters that, that expungement, broadly speaking, is a good thing, he focused on old records, the fact that we are not talking about people who um, commit additional offenses in, in the intervening period, and that a judge decides these petitions at a, at a hearing. Um, I think we all agree that that's the system we can get behind, and that is the system we have, largely speaking, now. Um, but, and the theory behind this is as time goes on, and you've heard this, I'm sure, as time goes on with no subsequent offenses, the risk of reoffense goes down. Um, this is clearly supported by data. So communities are safer when, um, and a person has more opportunity when a person who has committed a crime in the past has waited a certain period, has not committed any more crimes, and then you, you, and seeks an expungement um, from the court. I think that that's a system that, that works, but it's always dependent on what crimes and what period of time and what you do with the record. So do you expunge the record when it goes away forever or do you seal the record when it's available for certain purposes? Um, so um, unfortunately, this bill which does add a certain other layer of complexity, um, also enables the expungement of criminal records, which are not necessarily old records. We, and we already have various mechanisms in place that, that do that. We have court diversion, we have um, juvenile crimes, we have automatic expungements in certain circumstances. It's not like we've been sitting on our hands with respect to expungement of records over the last four years, every year, a bill has been passed, which further um, opens up opportunities for expungements. So, um, the uh, so so in this bill, 
um, if the theory is you're waiting a, long, a certain period of time for crime to be expunged, this bill enables the expungement of criminal records that are not necessarily old records under this system. Other records are already expunged under other sections of law. Um, a state's attorney has complete discretion to agree to a shorter waiting period or to delegate this discretion to the attorney general or another state's attorney. I understand that there was some additional work done on this question and that that discretion has been limited for the more serious property felony crimes. Um, but I would suggest it's generally a problem for a system that relies on length of time between release from um, their supervision or their incarceration and um, the and the, and the time that that runs as required for an expungement. Um, in this bill, the expungement decision is not necessarily a decision made by a judge with an opportunity for a hearing or a statement by a victim. Once a state's attorney agrees, the judge shall grant shall grant the petition for an expungement. So again, you're not you're no longer considering time period because a state's attorney can waive it for almost any crime that's expungeable, and you um, and the judge has no discretion in many cases whether to um, to hear the case. He just has to grant the expungement. So, so those are two of, of my concerns, and then. Some of the changes allow an intervening crime. So in some cases, you may have no waiting period or very short waiting period and the potential for an intervening crime. So this kind of shoots the whole theory of if you have a person who has waited a certain amount of time and who has not committed into an intervening crime, th this, this, this essentially eviscerates that theory. You, you don't, you have the permission to, to, to commit an intervening crime. And then you only need to wait the time served for the second crime until you obtain the expungement for the first crime. That's how I read this. Um, and if I'm incorrect, that would be great to know. But I think that that is a structural change that substantially changes our system of expungement right now. Um, the Office of the Attorney General has cited some compelling studies about the importance of a good job after incarceration, the value of expunged records after a waiting period with no intervening crimes, uh, and the theory that risk of reoffense goes down over time. But with these changes, we have, we would not be honest if we were saying to Vermonters, everybody has to wait and nobody can commit an intervening crime and a judge will determine each petition. So, so that's, um, I think it's a system that with these changes becomes shut full through of holes. Um, so I don't see any data presented by the attorney general um, or others, and, and I would be happy to receive it. Um, I hope you can, I'm happy to learn about this. And I have spent a lot of time looking at the studies that have been presented um, by uh, primarily attorney general. And they don't support programs which incorporate the loopholes incorporated in this bill. If we really are serious about evidence-based programs and data, then there are certain things we need to consider about this bill. Um, I mean, for example, you have a Michigan, you have a Harvard Law Review study that's cited that studies Michigan's system. And, and, the, and the conclusions are very, very positive, but Michigan's system is substantially different from Vermont's system with very little eligibility, actual eligibility for expungement. Um, few receive expungement because it does not permit an intervening crime. And the idea that there's a lower arrest rate among the expunged population is completely believable because People have waited a substantial period of time. They have not committed subsequent crimes. And in Michigan, length of record matters. So there can only be one crime in the record. So, so it's a substantially different system. And to say that Michigan's system and the outcomes from Michigan's system would be the same for Vermont's is a very optimistic statement, I think, to say the least. Um, so, 
So I understand though, that the committee wants to pass a bill this session. And I proposed certain changes um, to the chair and some others last night in the draft that I had, um, which I think reflect my concerns. They may not reflect all of the concerns that you might hear from Commissioner Sherling or Commissioner Baker. And those um, I would recommend that you, you listen to the subject matter experts uh, with, with, in that regard. Um, so I, you know, I, th I think that that's where I'm coming from is that we just want a system that works um, given the, 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 the structure that we have now, which is not a more global look at how we do expungements, which I appreciate there will be a study on that. Um, I appreciate that you have addressed expungement of crimes of sexual exploitation, which I think was taken out from the, from the, the, the current version of the law. Um, you deleted the section on other qualifying felonies, which includes things like domestic terrorism that I don't think anybody would know what happens to the record of a person who commits domestic terrorism. With taking that section out, you have effectively made it clear that that person is not entitled to an expungement, I'm hoping is the, the, the correct answer. Um, I know that DFR and who I, and I I think if you heard Mike, Mike Pichak yesterday, you know that they appreciated the extra time that the committee has given us to, to do a more in-depth review um, of the financial crimes that are in their purview. And they've done a risk analysis and they basically have come to the conclusion that an eight year period with no intervening crimes and sealing so that the record is available for law enforcement purposes is an acceptable solution and level of risk. And I think that probably I would agree. So I just don't think, and that was on a, a subset of very identifiable crimes that a regulatory authority was able to address uh, with their legal staff. So, so I think that it's important that we do that kind of analysis when we're talking about expungements generally and unlocking the potential of Vermonters. I think we need to understand the risks to the communities, the perception of the communities, you know, who, what, what Vermonters understand about whose record is wiped clean after what period of time is also a matter of perception, um, I would have to argue. And whether someone is correct about whether a murderer can be have their record expunged after 10 years because it's very unlikely that they will reoffend, I think that that's something we need to consider. Um, that seems to be what the data shows but I would not support that. Um, and I doubt most Vermonters would support that. So I would just, um, and I, I appreciate that the committee has been thoughtful, has taken testimony on this, has been working on this for a long time. Um, but I think we have the opportunity to make some changes that are more consistent with the way that the data supports. Um, and and I, 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 can't, I can't support some of the changes that, have, that remain in the bill. I'm sorry if that was a little rambly. I'm happy to answer questions. No, no, I very, very much appreciate it. And um, we do have a, um, looking at our website on my other um, computer, and we do have a number of um, documents that David DeMore shared with us. And, um, and I know that there is somebody with the Council of State Governments that specializes in expungements that, that certainly we can be in touch with. Um, I do see other hands. I do have one question. Can you help me understand when you said that this bill, that they're not necessarily old records? What, um, what do you mean by that? We've determined over the last four years that 10 years is too long and that five years is is about right, I guess. Generally speaking, most of the crimes that are expungible under this under this law are expungible after five years with no intervening offense. That's what the law says now. So um, as a policy matter, we have agreed that five years is old enough. Um, for other crimes, more serious crimes, like the, the felony um, property crimes, the policy that you've incorporated is that eight years is enough. Um, and again, DFR would agree with that because the fact of when you get the expungement is likely more like after 10 years. So, so, so that's the thing, as a policy matter, generally speaking, five years has been determined to be enough. 
Okay. I'll ch check the language of the bill. But, um, but in the meantime, uh, Selena, Barbara, and then Kate. Yeah, I, I had two questions, uh, if I may. And the first is, I'm wondering if you, um, and, and maybe you feel you've done this and I just haven't been able to track it closely enough, but it sounds like, you know, we have a new draft of the bill that I think was drafted largely to address some of the um, late hour concerns that have come forward from the administration and others. And can you be very specific about what you still don't, the administration is still doesn't support in this current draft? Because I heard a lot of just doubt about expungement in general and a, a few things, but I'm trying to get really clear on where the points of disagreement remain in the in the um, draft amendment that, that wasn't entirely clear to me from your testimony. Oh, well, last night I provided a, a, some, a red line um, so that may be helpful to you, but I think generally speaking, given the format that we're working in, um, we do not want to see, we would like to, to include, continue to include, no intervening crimes. We would like to um, make clear that the discretion, even for misdemeanors expungible in five years, of the um, state's attorney is within some boundaries. So what I have proposed is that some um, any period of rehabilitation has been successfully completed um, and no intervening crimes. So I have not ruled that out. I have just proposed some boundaries for the exercise of that discretion. Um, we are not opposing the reduction of any of the um, waiting periods, but again, the discretion is an issue. Um, and we, Let's see, what else did I put in there? Um, oh, and I would like to see when the stipulation is made by a state's attorney that when it goes to the court, um, the judge also determines whether the rehabilitation has been successfully completed. So while the judge shall just grant the, ex the expungement now, once an, a state's attorney exercises that discretion, the court will at least review for, um, for successful completion of rehabilitation. Now that may or may not work um, for the committee, but my goal was boundaries on the exercise of that discretion and some judicial input if, that's, if, that's, if there are no boundaries. Thank you, that's very helpful. And maybe if we could get you know, your red line postered or something that might be helpful as well. Um, and I, I would say too that, I mean, Commissioner Baker and Commissioner Sherling in their testimony may have proposed other changes. I know, um, I think I took out at least one crime from the felony property crimes, which is more like a violent crime involving use of force. Um, and I, um, I made some other miscellaneous changes. So I, I apologize in advance if I'm omitting to describe something, it is not um, an attempt to obfuscate. I think that the question of um, the administration's position on which crimes should be eligible is actually the second question I wanted to ask you um, given some of your testimony. So I heard, I heard you say, you know, with the example of of murder, which I understand is a, you know, that's a very emotional example on all sides. Um, but I heard you say that, you know, the evidence that someone is really unlikely to recommit that crime um, is, is not a, is not really a point of influence for the administration's position. Can you tell us if that if, if that kind of data isn't informing the, um, how the administration is, you know, determining which, which crimes they support expungement eligibility for, what, what is, what is, how, how is the administration determining, um, you know, like when you say you went through and just omitted a bunch of crimes that that I that I understand to mean the administration wouldn't support a bill that included those crimes from the property crimes, what 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 data points is informing what the administration will or won't support here? 
think generally speaking right now, we are not supporting violent crimes. Um, we have listed offenses exempted. Um, that includes the big 12. And recently, you know, human trafficking was added to listed. I think that um, we generally throw around listed, often throw in a couple exceptions here or there, depending on the law. But generally speaking, listed offenses are violent offenses. Um, and that's what we have. That's what we work with. Um, that's what I would like to see remain. Um, and then other crimes, well, like the violent, you know, the, the, the use of force crime in the, the felony property, I think that Commissioner Sherling can give you more information, but that would include larceny on the person, which is essentially a person stealing something from your person. That's, you know, a mugging or something like that. So the data is important. Um, I think that also varies by crime. So you look at the type of crime and the likelihood of reoffense, like domestic violence and sexual violence um, and exploitation of children. Like those crimes, some of those crimes, um, your offenders are more likely to reoffend. So I think that that's an important consideration. When you look at the laws of other states, there are, there are various um, pick and choose your own adventure on which crimes are expungible and which crimes are not. But like I said, so the data is important, um, but I do think that, and I would think representatives would be very sensitive to this, what is important to their constituents? Um, which crimes would your constituents, if they understood what expungement means, which ones would they like to see expunged? And after what period of time? I think that's something you know, you have to be honest with Vermonters about. That seems like a really subjective analysis. So do you have- I think that most of what we do is pretty would, subjective. So you have thoughts about how you would get at that? I would imagine different Vermonters would have very, very different points of view about how to answer that question around the state and even within our own constituencies. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to consider that metric and it seems like a really tricky one compared to actually analyzing, you know, pu real public safety risks. I so think you're how absolutely you, right. How, you would, how, how would we ascertain that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you've already ascertained it to a certain extent. You said no listed crimes. Yeah, I guess I'm just hearing you say that we should be going further in your testimony. Um, I, the only thing I testified to was um, the larceny on the person. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and I would say, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, just to add that length of time also matters. So it's not just what crime, it's what crime and for how long. And you are looking, of course, at what the data supports. But again, I do believe it's important to be honest with Vermonters when we make these decisions that, you know, while you may believe that some of your constituents think expunging murder would be fine because the likelihood of murder after 10 years is very, very low, I would, I would imagine most Vermonters would beg to differ. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, Kate, and Ken. Thank you. Um, just so Jay, two, two things I just feel compelled to say before I ask you questions. One is, I think it's always important for us to be honest with our constituents. And I can't imagine that we would, any of us, and I don't think you're saying that, that's why I want to sort of clear the record, think that we would, um, keep things from our constituents or try to bamboozle them. So, I mean, I across all three parties, integrity is really important. And so I just wanna say that, and I'm, I'm sure you would agree. I mean, you're, I, I assume you weren't making a character um, judgment on any of us. Absolutely not. Yeah. No. Okay. Of course that just not. Seems, I just, yeah. I just did want to make the point that expungement is very 
and maybe I didn't make it well, obviously. <laughs> I just, I think expungement is not easily understood or on the minds of many if Vermonters. Um, I think it's complex. I don't know that anybody or very few people could tell you what is the difference between expungement and sealing, which crimes are expungible and which aren't. I, I think that that's, I think that when, when Vermonters are led to believe that we're talking about old records with um, a period of time with no intervening crime, with a judge deciding on the petition, that gives people a certain amount of comfort. But when we change those rules, um, it just makes it even harder for Vermonters to understand. So um, the other piece is just to sort of uh, name it, we're, we're not eager to get a bill passed. We're eager to improve outcomes for Vermonters who, um, have been part of our criminal justice system. Um, I get that the second bill is very sort of patchwork and, and my sense is if we looked to do something that sort of held together philosophically, like most other states have done, um, like Michigan or Illinois or even, that I'm not sure the governor would have supported that. So I have a feeling sometimes in the name of compromise, it ends up getting more hard to explain what the rationale is. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of, um, I, I know you talked a lot about sealing and having law enforcement have access, but having law enforcement have access is exactly one of the things we're trying to address. If, if you look at any of the states, and I was just reading a, a Houston Law School article that was about expungement down in Texas, and they were talking about an armed robber who ended up um, being expunged and is a security guard and is very successful. So one of the things I'm worried about is you know, we've gotten a little better at our rates of incarceration, but um, we have so many people in Vermont that have criminal records and are in general, um, we're weak on rehabilitation compared to other states. So when someone's serving a 10 year term, they're getting services for the most part, their last six months, they're serving a 20 year term. So if we really care about rehabilitation, we need to put more money into that because I've talked to prisoners in other states who are getting a college degree and they get help getting housing, getting out and they're not set up for failure. Um, and I worry about people getting jobs with criminal records. I mean, even if it's, um, we just need to make it possible that people can get on with their lives or decide, sorry, you're all getting life sentences because we're never gonna forgive you. Um, but our current system is really expensive and our recidivism rates are super high. So I'd love to see us try to break away from that and get better outcomes. I agree that I think five years is great. The, the research looks like that's a really good time frame. And I wanted to make sure when you talk about further crimes that you're not talking about furlough violations or probation violations, because that has become a way that people keep getting looped in. And it's like they miss their appointment and they get sent back in and they really didn't break the law. They took the bus and their car broke down or, I mean, so, so that seems really important to me. Um, and, I, I guess I just want to also say when you talked about, you know, let's make sure about the rehabilitation, we can't, that's a lot of, for us to put on a prisoner who's not getting the kind of rehabilitation that I believe we could do and have better outcomes. Um, so, I mean, I think everyone's worry is we're going to give someone uh, an expungement and then they're gonna do something awful and we're all gonna feel like it was our fault. Um, but there are people who end up getting desperate because they can't do anything and they're breaking the law. And in some ways, all the lives that we're um, not helping to be successful 
feels crummy. And so I'd love to see us make some headway and see how the research in our own state plays out. But um, every time we sort of cherry pick or move stuff around, I just worry that we further, as you say, move away from what the evidence-based research is showing. And, um, you know, so I guess those are my thoughts and I don't know if you have like any I, thoughts I do. based on my thoughts. Okay. Sure. Um, I completely agree that we need to be focusing on rehabilitation. And I believe that that is the direction that DOC is going in connection with justice reinvestment efforts. Uh, we need to appropriately identify the services necessary for the people coming out of the system, which is not always done. And I think Commissioner Baker may have testified or is testifying um, to the extent that, that some of this effort may actually interfere with that effort. But, but the committee is willing to make a change that as long as a person is not, um, is, is under the supervision of DOC, there will be no expungement, um, which is helpful. So your concern that furlough violations or probation violations would be involved wouldn't be happening because they would be out of the supervision of the DOC. So I don't think that is a concern. Um, with respect to intervening offenses, I mean, you would, you would, the state would have to be accepting a policy of expungement upon release because you, and which is not supported by the data, but would give people the clean slate they need to start over um, without necessarily having the appropriate rehabilitation resources. So, um, so we've picked five years and I think we're talking about five years with no intervening offenses um, to sort of allow intervening offenses really runs counter to the concept of a person who is successfully eligible for expungement. Um, Jane, does it matter which crime it is? Because again, if it's, if it's possessing drugs and they have an addiction problem, I would say, what the heck do we have them in our criminal justice system rather than in our treatment? system because it goes counter to successful treatment. I completely agree that, that, that people with issues, um, with drug misuse issues should be receiving appropriate treatment and that should be in our facilities and when they get out of the facilities. Um, once they've, you know, that's why we're focusing on appropriate supervision in order to respond to those needs. I think that a lot, that work is being done um, and it's important that that work is able to be done effectively. So, um, so I think you're absolutely right there that, 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 that people with, with mental health issues and with substance misuse issues are, are receiving appropriate services for their needs. Um, no argument, but once you're out of the system, arguably successfully treated or continuing treatment, you are, you're, you're, Expungement is, is an option for you after five years, if you know, and that's, um, I mean, I would also argue and Commissioner Baker could testify to the efforts they're making with respect to internships and job training while um, a person is incarcerated or on supervision. So, um, so, and the length of time absolutely matters. So if you're a, a drug possession crime is a whole, you know, possession of meth is a whole lot different than selling meth. Um, and those crimes should be, oh, I did make that change. That's another change I made. Um, the, I would take out the possession crime, I mean, the sale crimes. So possession, I completely understand that people with misuse need, with substance misuse are often the victims as well as the perpetrators. People who are selling, I have less sympathy for. I mean, and again, this is my personal view. And like, um, I think Rep Colburn, said a lot of this is is personal is subjective is um but that's that's where i i would say there's a lot of damage in our communities because of people dealing um i don't believe that if they committed a crime that's i mean i i just i just feel feel like that that level of crime connect in and you have acknowledged you've drawn the line at um trafficking so Right, because um, trafficking, trafficking is huge. Yeah, right? when does trafficking crime get pled down to a sale crime? I mean, I don't know if we have that data or if you've heard that data. Um, I think that those are the kinds of questions we should be asking. 
because frequently people who are addicted are selling enough to cover their expenses. And so it really is, it's more about their addiction than it is about trafficking. And I agree, like there's a slippery slope, but it's addictions, it's tough. I mean, it's tough. And I'm convinced as long as it stays as mixed messages and it's in the criminal justice system, we're gonna be less successful. Thank so you. The, the question is, are the crimes expungible and not how should they be treated? Um, and again, expungible and when? Those are really the issues we're talking about in connection with this bill. True. Thank you. Um, before I get to um, other committee members, I do want to ask Attorney Brinhair to um, to join us because um, and and remind us of the different time frames. Um, because Jay, I believe I hear you saying, um, you know, five years, and 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 in fact, it's it's different years. We have depending upon the crime, um, their ceiling, and then after that, expungement after another time. So I think it's important to um, not to generalize, but to really look at the um, specific crimes. And also, Jay, I think I heard you um, refer to murder, and murder is not expungible under this bill. Yeah. Listed bill, listed crimes, which include the Big Twelve, are not expungible. So, so Bryn, thank you. Um, if if you could point us um, to the different sections of the bill and help us understand um, sealing interve intervening crimes um, and expungement, but I think that'd be helpful. And then we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Sure. So, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. So um, as, as you know, there are several um, different categories of crimes that are um, eligible for sealing or expungement under the bill. And each different category is subject to a different waiting period. So essentially a period of time where a person um, is, is not involved with the justice system um, before they're eligible for a sealing or expungement. So, um, and those, those waiting periods are are keyed to the satisfaction of the judgment. So um, I, I have heard some testimony this morning about um, keying the timeframes to the completion of, a, of uh, a subsequent offense. But I just wanna point out that throughout the bill, you've keyed the timeframe to um, the satisfaction of the judgment, either for the underlying offense or for the subsequent offense, but the timeframe still applies. So if you take a look, for example, on page 11, just looking at, um, these are possession of a controlled substance offenses. These are offenses that are currently eligible for expungement. Possession of a controlled substance is currently eligible for expungement under existing law. Um, they are eligible for expungement. So if you look at line 15, five years from the date on which the person satisfied the judgment for the offense, or if there is, if the person committed a subsequent offense, you have to wait five years from the date that the person um, satisfied the judgment for the subsequent offense. So you have to kind of read the whole thing together. Um, that would be B, one, A, two. Um, and you have to key back to that uh, subdivision A that says at least five years have elapsed since. So um, I just wanted to make it clear that when you're keying the, the time frame, you gotta keep looking at what the time frame is based on when the person com um, completed the, the sentence for either the original offense or the subsequent offense. Oh, I, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I would just suggest that that be clarified because that is not how I read it. So, um, so I'll carry on. So um, subsection B, that's the qualifying predi non-predicates and then the um, possession of a, of a controlled substance that is the five-year waiting period. <clears throat> and then there, um, and then if you scroll down to page 13, subsection C is qualifying predicate misdemeanors. So that um, is, a, an, again, a five-year waiting period um, for the petition to seal to be granted. And then there is an additional waiting period um, for the expungement. If a person wants to have a sealed record expunged, um, they are eligible five years after the sealing order. Um, so essentially, that would be a that would be a ten year waiting period um, if all if if there was no intervening offense, and they couldn't they would not be eligible for expungement 
if they did commit a subsequent offense under that category of offenses. Um, DUI offenses are subject to a 10 year waiting period um, and sealing only. Burglary offenses are subject to a 15 year waiting period. And then the qualifying felony property offenses and under this amendment, the sale, dispensation and transport of regulated substances are subject to an eight year waiting period um, for sealing and um, are eligible for expungement eight years after uh, eight years after the record has been sealed if there is no intervening or subsequent offense. So um, and I'll just point out that although you're not you're not amending it in the bill, there's also the provision uh, that allows a person to have a criminal history record expunged if that underlying conduct is no longer considered criminal and there is no waiting period for that. So essentially you have a you have a range of waiting periods that start from no waiting period for um, conduct that's no longer criminal to 15 year waiting period for um, certain types of, of burglary offenses. But um, the, yep, so I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that and let you carry on. I appreciate that, Brenda. I think that's, that's, that's very helpful. Where was I? Okay, so I think Kate, Ken and Selena. Thanks. I was <clears throat> just waiting to unmute. Um, so I, I appreciate your initial attention to research, and I'm curious, um, it's not a rhetorical question, I'm genuinely curious. Um, do you have any evidence or data, you know, if we're talking about uh, potential concerns about the public safety impact of expungement, do you have any data or evidence to suggest that expungements as we're discussing them in this bill are a threat to public safety in Vermont? I think expungements as you're discussing them in this bill, um, except for limited cases, don't necessarily pose a public safety threat to Vermonters. That's why that's the policy now. I do object to, I mean, and that's why I would like clarified, if you're proposing that intervening crimes are not counted essentially until you've served your term or you've satisfied your judgment for the intervening crime, that's one thing. If what Bryn is saying is that five years must pass after the intervening crime, I'm assuming with no intervening crime, um, then I would, I would say that nothing has changed. So I'm sorry, but my, I guess my specific question was related to data. Do you have any data to suggest that expungement is a threat to public safety in, in Vermont? I'm not saying that expungement is a threat to public safety in Vermont. I'm saying that the data that we have shows that the longer you wait and with no intervening crimes, the lower the rate of recidivism. So that would suggest that there is a higher rate of risk to Vermonters in the early years and a lower rate of risk in the later years. Thanks, I think that aligns with what we've heard in other testimony. I mean, in terms of this discussion of, of what Vermonters believe or don't believe, again, I'm just curious if you have any data or research on Vermonters' perspectives on expungement in general that you're referring to, or if this is just sort of a, your, your perspective on the belief of Vermonters around the issue of expungement. I don't believe there is any data on expungement in Vermont. So my, I don't have data on perceptions of Vermonters. You all know your communities better than I do. I would just say that like I think Representative Rachelson said, or um, Representative Colburn, this is absolutely subjective. And a lot of it is perception. Um, so you would know better, you, you know, how the feeling in your community is if you explain to them what expungement is, what it does and what the crimes eligible are. And I think that, I mean, that's just my sense. Um, and right now, 
we're talking about expanding to a certain number of crimes and I haven't objected to those crimes. The, I mean, I have objected to the sale crimes, but I haven't objected to all of the other property crimes. Um, but time will tell. I mean, but the period is long. The period is eight years and it's, um, it's sealed. So that it's the crime and the length of time and what happens to the record and the risk analysis has been done by at least one agency with those crimes in their bailiwick and they feel that it, uh, it adequately addresses the risk. Thank you. So I, if you're I, asking, do I have, I have data a... on perceptions of Vermonters about expungement? No, I don't think that exists. I don't know that most Vermonters know what expungement is. Thank you. I have one other question, but just before I move on to that, I think my, my if I heard correctly in your testimony, I heard you making some statements about what you believe most Vermonters would think about expungements. And I, I do feel compelled to say as a born and raised Vermonter who's queer, um, I, I become concerned when we talk about Vermonters monolithically and what Vermonters do or don't believe. And so I'm just hopeful that as we have these conversations, we can acknowledge that uh, Vermonters as a term does not encompass one one perspective or form of, of thought. Um, in terms of um, data collection, you know, data has been a big point of discussion in our committee. Um, and, you know, we've been told repeatedly sort of the just how difficult it is to gather data. And I think there's a lot of legislative um, efforts that are focused right now on um, trying to track and gather data within, you know, the criminal justice system and um, as it pertains to racial justice. And it's clear to me um, that there's strong commitment to this, but that it's going to take time, it's going to take resources. And so, you know, in terms of talking about sort of dismissing data from other states because it's not specific to Vermont with this, you know, coupled with this awareness of just how challenging it's ultimately going to be to, to eventually get Vermont's data in order. I guess I'm just curious, like, how local do you need data to be on this issue in order to be sort of compelled um, to, to respect what the data is reading? And, and I guess, you know, how, how long... How long do we wait exactly? Well, so are you suggesting we don't need data? I mean, I, I would say that it should at least be roughly analogous. I know that the, that the opportunities are very limited across the 50 states because expungement and sealing is designed to make information go away. So there is nothing built into our law that would allow say research of de-identified data or under some kind of a um, data use agreement to permit research. Um, I'm pretty sure that our law doesn't do that and it, it could do that. I know that the Michigan study that that group um, that is cited in the AG's research is um, a, a, a particular group was granted access to Michigan's data under a confidentiality agreement and they were, um, and the system hadn't changed for roughly 10 years or something. So they were able to have apples to apples comparisons. That would be virtually impossible in Vermont because our law has changed four times in four years at the very least. Um, so I think that it's very difficult to it, when is again, it's going to be a policy decision and that's gonna be up to the legislature. I can say that from our perspective, it we're unlikely or I am unlikely to recommend that violent crimes be expungible. And by expungement, of, of we're not talking, and again, expungement is a large concept. If what we're talking about, again, is giving Vermonters who have old, old records and who have not committed a crime in many years, the opportunity to expunge their record, we're all in. That's not what this bill is doing. So it also depends on the principles that you're working with. So you're, you're saying, just, just to clarify that last comment regarding violent, are you suggesting that even if the research were to bear out that it was not a threat to public safety to expunge someone's past violent crime, you would still oppose it? 
I guess we've been around this. I think that it is a matter of perception in your communities. And from say my personal perspective, I would not want to know that there is, well, I mean, I guess Rep Lalonde, I had heard that he had raised the issue of how expungements work with the sex offender registry, say, for example. Um, I don't know how that works. I, I would say that that is worth further study. Um, I think different people are going to have different ideas about what crimes are important and who's committing them. So do you want a police officer with um, a history of use of force to become a police officer after expungement? Well, you might think that if you've got um, a philosophy that's completely consistent and based on the data that you would. Um, it's not an area where you can start to pick and choose if you're going to be strictly focused on data that doesn't exist. So it's gonna be a policy decision. I think um, I, I just have one more comment, and then I and then I'll defer to others. I, I think one of the the discussions that's come up in the course of um, a few different bills is um, I've voiced a concern that people want data, but that often when the data is borne out, there's still resistance, and I think that resistance is often ideological in nature. And I think you know I, I, this is what's coming to mind for me as we're having this conversation. So, thank you for your responses. Great. And, and I would so, like to say that, again, listed crimes, I think, cross ideologies. Thank you. So a lot of hands up. So um, Ken, Selena, Tom, and then Martin. Um, I, was, I was just going to, uh, before I start, I appreciate it, but uh, I see Commissioner Sherling's hands up. I don't know if he has to run quick, if if you That's want me to wait and go after him or what his time is. Um, thank you. I did not see his, his hand. So, Commissioner. Thank you. I, I'm well past my um, 11 o'clock deadline. So uh, I, I think I'll just I'll deal with the rest of the schedules uh, uh, differently. Uh, my hand was up to uh, uh, help to respond to a couple of the questions that just emerged. I can try to hold that uh, so that the committee members can engage with Jay if that works for you, Madam Chair. And I apologize for taking the commissioner's time. Um, it's it's really up to the chair. Yeah, it's it's fine. Um, and he should probably um, testify to some of the areas where I'm not a subject matter expert and he clearly is. Thank you. Uh, and if we, don't get to the everything uh, we need to with the commissioner today. We certainly will continue the um, conversation. So again, uh, Ken, Selena, Tom, and then Martin. So uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon, whatever it is, Jay. And uh, thanks for showing up. Um, I think what I'm clearly um, hearing, and and this is my big concern uh, with this is. I'm looking for accountability, or I probably I'm not supposed to ask it like that, but I think what you're looking for is accountability uh, for what's happened, happened, uh, keeping uh, Vermont safe when we do this expungement or sealing. Am I correct with that? Yes, I would say accountability, um, keeping Vermonters safe is, a, or of course, should always be top of mind. And again, I think how we do that generally speaking, without getting into the violent crimes or the sexual offenses, which are also listed, um, you're looking at crime time period and ideally um, the op opportunity for a hearing before a judge. I think that gives you the accountability that you need and it's supported by the data. Do you think we've expunged at this point uh, any crimes that we shouldn't have? Uh, I could only speak to anecdote. I know that um, there are some state's attorneys who are getting waivers now. Um, I guess you'd have to um, get more information about that. But I, I do believe, and I think Mike can maybe speak to this, I, I may be speaking out of turn, is that there have been some questions about how certain waivers interact with the 
sex offense registry? Um, so just clarifying in my mind, so in most cases that we've done and what we're looking at, the five-year um, time period is okay. And if it's more of the serious crimes, it goes to the 10-year. And then if, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, somebody that commits a crime uh, messes up again, then it all goes out the window and we start back at scratch, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, 10 years is no longer, um, I mean, it's eight years for the serious crimes you've identified in your bill, um, but it's, uh, yes, five years for the less serious crimes. And I would argue that that is what you want. If um, you commit an intervening crime, it all goes out the window. But it sounds like from what Bryn is saying, if that's clear, um, that's what would happen. So, you know, another thing that, that crosses my mind is we have all kinds of jobs out there available right now, and we don't have people um, that are filling them. So I, I, there's, there's a lot of this, uh, this, this talk with the expungement and, and the ceilings and everything that I, I have to, to, to wonder um, why people aren't maybe taking a chance on some of this or whatever, which leads me into my next question is, do we have any idea how much this, all this is really costing the, the, the state financially? Um, I, I would say that the better question is, um, first of all, do people know about expungements? Do people know if it's affecting their lives? Um, if their record is affecting their lives. If it's not, um, we don't, I don't know that we know that, um, but it may ref be reflected in the uptake rate of expungements, which I and see David Schur just joined. Maybe they have more information about the uptake rate in Vermont. Um, the other thing would be, I would say that there is a lot of other, there may be a lot of other reasons why those jobs aren't being filled and why many of our, um, former offenders are, are not getting those jobs. I mean, that's all I can speak to. Like, like I think Rep. Uh, Rachelson said, you know, there are people with um, addiction issues and there are people with mental health issues and there are people who lack training. And I, we've got a Department of Labor set up to address the training issues. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, I think it's a multifaceted question, and I think that expungement may be a piece of it for some people. I don't know about the cost. Um, others would have to testify about um, how effective our program is or the uptake rate or what we know about the people whose records have been expunged and what their, their in, in improved opportunities have been. I, I don't have that data. Um, I, I heard you say public uh, perception of uh, expungement, and uh, and and I um, agree with you on that. I don't think most people. I I know people that have asked me about what's going on with what what is expungement, what is the ceiling stuff, and all this stuff. They have no idea. And then I'll explaining explain it a little bit, and uh, probably I'd say eight or nine out of ten people go and say, well, don't you think it's fair? that I know the person that I'm dealing with, that I'm looking to hire, um, uh, that, that comes to work in my company. I mean, you're kind of putting me at risk that who I'm putting out there to uh, possibly go in somebody's home or something like that. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of setting me up for failure. And I, I've heard that as a, as, as a, as a, a, a serious issue and, and I think, you know, public, um, just how the public uh, looks upon this. I think what we've done, we've come a long ways um, by my, by not my numbers. I think, I think we've expunged. Um, like 23 or 24,000 people already. I mean, in a, in a state that has a population of 
of uh, what, 640,000 people now or something like that. I'd say uh, we've done our due diligence on that, but uh, for right now, I'll, I'll, ju I'll just uh, um, I'll just wait and ask some some more questions later. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to um, Celine. I'm going to ask you to wait because you have spoken before. Um, so I'll go to to Tom and um, Martin uh, first, who have who have not spoken yet. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Jay. Uh, I don't really have a question for you, uh, just something you touched on, uh, and, and I think I know how it works. That uh, Somebody can uh, petition a prosecutor, I think it is, for an early expungement, the way it works, and, and you brought up the concern of possibly uh, having a, a judge involved in it, and, and I, I think, I, I, think, I don't think, I, I agree with that. And the main reason is, is through the years, we've done a lot of work around geographical justice in, in this committee. And, and, and I think we're, we would be throwing ourselves right back into more geographical justice. Um, and by having, uh, you know, whether it's a judge or somebody else uh, involved in that process, I think it lessens that um, that uh, opportunity for geographical justice, and, and I, and and I hope uh, as a committee we can possibly, uh, you know, discuss that and having it, you know, a twofold or maybe a threefold, uh, um, um, or three people even uh, deciding whether or not somebody uh, is eligible. Um, it, it, Again, it, to me, it just makes sense for the, the work that we've done in the past. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin and then uh, and Selena. Um, so a, a dumb question really quickly is, do I say Counselor Johnson? Because I don't want to be calling you Jay and then go and say Commissioner Shirley. That just doesn't seem right. Oh, and then, I call him, and then I call him Mike. Well, I don't, you know, I can't, I can't get myself to do that. So okay. counselor, <laughs> counselor, yes, yeah. yes, yes, so, attorney, whatever. I have, I have a, just a, a concern from one thing you raised that if you could comment on, and it's something that I heard the other day from uh, Dale Crook uh, as well. And that's this concept of looking not at what the charge was that led to the conviction or the actual plea, but the concept of looking at what the behavior may have been so that uh, one can see that, oh, they pled down from trafficking. And specifically, you were mentioning this in the concept of why uh, you don't like to see the sales uh, of, of various uh, illegal uh, drugs uh, as part of the expungible offenses. And, and you mentioned that, well, it, a sale could be something that's pled down from trafficking. And, and that concerns me that it, it also just yesterday what we heard was uh, in looking at uh, the uh, risk assessments in the Department of Corrections, uh, they'll look at the affidavit to try to determine really what under was underlined the, the charge and not actually at what uh, ultimately was part of a plea agreement. And I'm just very concerned that we're looking at it for these two different instances now, the concept of looking at the affidavits or whatever's underlying the charge as opposed to what the conviction was, be it through actually a trial or through the plea agreement. I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, I think that's an excellent point um, that, w but, but the issue there is doing risk assessments that adequately address the needs of our client population, the people in supervision or the people who are incarcerated. So if you're really concerned about being able to do adequate risk assessments to provide the services those people need, you will want them to be looking at the underlying behavior so that they could address that. If those records are gone, that's impossible. Um, the behavior, I mean, 99% of our cases are settled without a trial. So that's what the, the, the council and state governments realize that 99% of our cases. So we know that they are probably, most of those are pled down from something. And I think there's even data on that, that the council of state governments um, gave us, which I could, I'm happy to share if I can find it. Um, but so, so, so you know that most of those are not, so what they eventually plead to is not 
necessarily reflective of the behavior. I would completely agree with you. So I guess, uh, but then turning on to the expungement part, as far as if that's one of the bases for not uh, agreeing with expunging sales uh, of drugs, that, that, that concerns me. So if you could further explain what the basis for wanting to exclude those expungible offenses. Well, the, again, the, the drug sale and uh, transport offenses, that is. Well, I think um, as, as one of the representatives explained, I mean, there's two sides to every issue. One is, you know, many of the people who are selling are also victims, but there is the flip side, which is the uh, trafficking. And again, Mike Sherling is way more qualified to talk about this than I am. But, you know, it's possible that somebody who's, who's convicted, who's charged with trafficking pleads down to sale. Um, I think that you don't, you, you expunge those sale crimes and you are not looking back at the behavior and you're actually expunging much more serious crimes. Yeah, and I guess that that part, you know, the, your, your explanation certainly for risk assessments and DOC, I understand that a little bit more than this is a basis for not uh, having sales uh, expungible uh, so in any event, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hear from, we'll hear from Commissioner Sherling on that as well. I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Selena, and then we'll, um, and then we'll turn to uh, the commissioner. So I was actually gonna ask about um, the sales and dispensing crime too, um, given our earlier conversation. So is, is that the, I heard you say you don't support it. Am I to understand that the administration also doesn't support expungement? That's not, is that just a personal opinion of yours or is that the administration's position that they do not support expungement eligibility for sales and dispensing of regulated drug crimes? I would defer to the commissioner on that. Okay. Um, yeah, it would be good to get clarity on that and um, I guess I would just, because that's certainly, I heard earlier the criteria for the administration's sort of rubric on which crimes they would support expungement eligibility for what I heard from you and maybe I misunderstood it was that it really came down to a question of violent crimes, which largely were not. <laughs> so so my, per my personal view is not any different than I think what the administration's view would be, and I, that's not helpful. Um, but I, and, and again, I defer to the commissioner. But I think that, again, I express my concern that in five years, and oh no, I guess it's eight years, you could seal records of sales. Um, that's, you know, I mean, again, it's a policy call. It's not ideal because of, as Rep. Land pointed out, what we don't know about sale convictions. Um, so I think that we would um, we would have to be listening to both sides on this. Well, I'll share one side, um, just as someone who's spoken to a lot of folks who are in recovery from substance use disorder and opioid use disorder specifically. It's often not the possession offenses because those aren't actually charged that often for as it's often folks who have sales um, you know convictions hanging over them um, because they sold in small amounts by coercion or just by or just or just by out of sheer need to um, support their own dependence. And I can tell you, you know, a story of meeting a young man a few years ago who told me his story, which is that he was arrested for selling small amount of heroin to support his own dependence. And he was able to succeed in recovery by driving over three hours round trip daily to the only available treatment center at the time, there was a two plus year wait for treatment access in Chittenden County at that point. So he drove all the way down to like Lebanon, New Hampshire every single day to the methadone clinic, went into recovery. Um, I met him in the context of a community college class that he was taking where I was a guest visitor. 
And he told me about the struggles that he had had um, finding employment, finding housing, um, accessing education because of this record. He couldn't supervise a field trip for his child or coach Little League because of this record. And um, it's easy to, I mean, we can say, and it's probably true that a lot of Vermonters don't aren't aware of expungement or don't have a perspective on it, but I can guarantee you that Vermonters like that are well aware of expungement and its benefits and are waiting for this body to act in ways that support their long-term recovery. You know, folks who have essentially done everything we've asked of them to pay their dues for their crime and have worked tremendously hard to turn their lives around. And um, I guess I'm just still struggling with trying to understand and maybe the commissioner's testimony will clarify the administration's position on expungement eligibility for these crimes. But I, I, I'm really concerned to hear that um, that they're, that these are being questioned, the expungement eligibility are being questioned. And I'm still, I'm still trying to understand what is the criteria for what the administration is supportive of and not. It's not. And, and representative, I appreciate your story, which is very compelling. Um, but I guess as we've discussed, uh, it would be great to see the data, generally speaking. Can you just clarify what the data that you're looking for with respect to- Well, you're speaking programs? to anecdote. Um, and and I, I think that, and I applaud you for your work in that area and for doing the listening that you've done. But um, again, we don't know what we don't know about the crimes of sales. So do we know that possessions, uh, so it, do we know? Do, are, do we know that possessions are really charged, that sales are charged more often, that those charges are um, simply because people are selling to maintain their habits? Um, you know, do we know, that, what do we know? I, I don't know and I'm, I'm happy to learn if I can get any you know, more information, more data on, on that particular thesis. Well, I like finding data because I'm a research librarian in my other job, so I'll see what I can do. Great. Okay, thank you. So, Commissioner, thank you for for your for your patience and welcome you. Thanks for having me. Are are we time limited? Um, I'd say about 10, 15 minutes. Okay. It, it is very unlikely I'm going to get through all of the points and in particular responses to some of the discussion in 10 minutes. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety, thanks for having me uh, back again on this issue. I will not reiterate uh, other than to flag that I spent quite a bit of time with the committee the last time I was here uh, outlining what I think is a better approach to expungement and sealing. And I'll actually start there and work uh, backwards. Um, I have a variety of notes in no particular order here are responding to some of the things that have been discussed so far. Um, and starting there, um, the concept that I presented of sealing rather than expungement would actually allow you to measure the impact of expungement. One of the questions that's been posed is, do we have any uh, data? Uh, the answer is no. And the answer also is we will never have data because the concept of expunging means you're eradicating a record and there is no way to know in the future whether someone whose record was expunged uh, has committed another offense. The record's been deleted. So it's not something that can be studied. Um, and it's one of the reasons I believe that expungement in general is not the correct balanced public policy that a ceiling um, version of this is, is the right way to go. Um, Starting, uh, so now back at the top, and then I'll try to work through as much of this as possible. Uh, again, we, you know, we do appreciate the focus. As I testified previously, we're supportive of the general policy goals here. Uh, many of the policy goals that have been outlined in questions from various representatives, um, the need for uh, many offenders to be able to get uh, historic offenses in the rearview mirror, 
Um, but the system is incredibly complex and confusing. Um, and multiple lawyers reading the current draft of the bill will give you different interpretations on what exactly it means and how to follow it. Um, when you have to describe B1A2 in terms of the sequence of interpretation, it's just too complicated. Um, so the, my primary piece of feedback continues to be simplify this um, system so that it can be understood not only by uh, folks operating in the justice system, but equally important by Vermonters who, uh, there are no studies on what Vermonters think of expungement, what they think of sentencing, um, but I can say with confidence that they and most people who work in the justice system um, don't understand the way we sentence and the way we do expungement because the systems are so incredibly complicated. Um, one, uh, one of CSG's core pieces of feedback was to simplify the probation and parole system. And it's just too complicated to navigate, even for people who are working in that system on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think the same argument can be extended uh, to, to this. Um, the, uh, in terms of specific feedback, um, much of this has evolved to be a little more fragmentary than, or fragmented than I originally had intended, but there's so many things, so many threads that have been pulled on in the last hour and a half. Um, the risk of reoffense for the majority of things does go down as time passes. And the risk of reoffense goes down as people age because uh, of a variety of different, both physiological and maturity factors. But that is not universal. Um, there are some types of offenses where there is extensive data that indicates that uh, a predisposition to offend does not go away. Um, those include sex offenses, some types of domestic violence offenders, uh, and some kinds of crimes. And I'll get into a little bit more detail um, in just a minute. It is also important to note that while there are plenty of accurate anecdotes about people who ha are trying um, and are being very successful at rehabilitating themselves, there are also those that you may run into from time to time who are misrepresenting the nature of relative to drug dealing or a violent crime or something of that nature. And without reading the actual court record, the affidavit and the evidence, you don't know that what they're representing to you is an accurate account of what actually occurred. Um, with drug dealing in particular, I, I think in the vast majority of places in Vermont that uh, I have been, um, I have touched the justice system. It is accurate to say that low level possession of drugs is often not charged and sent to some alternative program. At the same time, low level dealing is often dealt with as a possessory charge. Um, everything kind of ratchets down one notch or more uh, in the outcomes that are achieved within the justice system, largely in deference to the kinds of circumstances that have been discussed at length over the last hour and a half, that um, for, for those um, sale offenses that are to um, support a, a, an addiction, that's recognized by prosecutors in courts and adjustments are made on the fly and the conviction um, reflects that in the overwhelming majority of circumstances. Um, the, uh, the next note I have is, uh, again, as Jay indicated, judicial oversight is missing here, and it is essential if we're going to continue to move. Uh, I I've heard everyone in the justice system and in every branch of government indicate that one of the goals is to reduce the disparity of outcomes across our 14 different systems of justice. Um, doing this without judicial oversight, and I would suggest unified oversight of some sort, an expungement judge, someone assigned to specifically look at these cases to ensure, ensure uniformity uh, across all of the petitions for this is a better way of operating than um, doing it by default. There are just too many variables in relationships and um, in the way that our various systems operate, the outcomes will become more disparate, not less disparate without that level of uniformity. Uh, in terms of specific offenses, um, I, I think, and I asked Jay to correct me if I'm wrong, she was testifying that the sale of methamphetamine was the thing that there was a specific concern about. Um, I do have some concerns about sale, uh, not that they should, of all drugs, not that they should all be excluded by default, 
but that an extra level of diligence on the review of those may be necessary to ensure that they're not a trafficking case or a high level case that's been pled down because a witness died. Um, you know, the, 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 the 99% of plea bargains I would submit are overwhelmingly the result of system capacity coupled with impacts and availability of victims and witnesses. Um, and the most important piece of that puzzle uh, being to minimize the ongoing trauma to victims of crime by not putting them in a position where they have to testify to the greatest extent possible. And that's a very well-known operating uh, tenant within the justice system. And that is one of the things and, and that array of things that I just described drive the high level of, uh, of plea bargains that exist uh, in Vermont. And as a result, it's not uncommon for the conviction to be a step down, in some cases, multiple steps down from what the original fact pattern uh, indicates, which brings me to another side point, which is um, there was a question about uh, whether whether it's in these circumstances or others that you're looking at, or uh, pre-sentence investigations, for example, that you look at the conviction versus the facts in the affidavit. The facts in the affidavit are the only account that exists, the facts and, and the, the case itself. So uh, conviction is often not reflective of the fact pattern itself. So in order to get a sense of what happened, it's the only way to do it based on the evidence and the facts in the case, not just what's written in a, uh, a final conviction record, which may not match the fact pattern in many ways. Um, so go back a step uh, to the, the things that give me pause in, in terms of what's uh, eligible for expungement. And again, I would be having probably a different conversation on some of these if they were sealed versus expunged. Um, but four things stood out um, higher than anything else in my review of what's in this particular bill. Uh, embezzlement is one, uh, often a crime that is repeated, um, one in which uh, offenders will tell you that their, their second and subsequent offenses when they do occur were opportunistic. They, were, uh, they feel bad that they were put in a position where it was another opportunity and they were unable to control um, their underlying predisposition to embezzle. Uh, and it's one that you hear from employers with some frequency that uh, those are the kinds of offenders that, that concern them the most. Folks, folks that may have a predisposition for violence in the workplace would be number one, but those who are going to steal from the company being number two and obfuscating that from view, uh, even with a delay in time uh, is a questionable public policy. Uh, identity theft, um, I'm not gonna to spend too much time there, but something that's growing in, um, in its impact of a wide array of people. I just, I don't know that um, that's a good idea uh, for a host of reasons. Uh, methamphetamine and dealing methamphetamine for the reasons I mentioned relative to drug dealing, but also specific to methamphetamine for two additional reasons. One, meth is a little different than most other drugs um, because it is something that is, can be constructed on site. The majority of cases of methamphetamine that we deal with in Vermont are what are called one pot operations. They can be, uh, meth can be made in a uh, one liter Coca-Cola, Pepsi, pick your uh, whichever, um, whichever uh, camp you're in there, um, to, uh, to, to cook meth. So dealing it is something that's quite a different equation. You don't need a trafficker in the background um, to begin cooking and dealing methamphetamine. So that is the first uh, significant differentiator here uh, and a reason that we would object to having um, the sale uh, be expungible under these circumstances. But most importantly, the top reason among the three is uh, the level of destruction to communities if we lose control of methamphetamine. Right now, knock on wood, it has not been a high prevalence crime in Vermont. If it were to come here, like some states in the Midwest, it is more destructive than anything you've ever seen before in terms of uh, its impact on people, its impact on families, and the collateral violent crime that goes with it, it makes our opiate epidemic look like a walk in the park. So any lane of travel that we give to people, whether it's writing this simply down saying you can have your record expunged in the future, 
um, or any other lane of travel we give to people to experiment with methamphetamine as something to bring to our communities is a hard no uh, from the Department of Public Safety. It is simply too dangerous and too destructive. Uh, and finally, larceny from the person, which Jay also mentioned, um, this is actually a violent crime. It's not, it, it's written as a larceny. It's a mugging. It's a strong arm robbery. It's a, uh, someone um, comes up to you at the ATM machine, um, tells you to, they're, to get all your money out and give it to them or they're going to beat you up or they do beat you up and, uh, and take your, your ATM card. Um, that is uh, a larceny from the person. Um, it should not be confused with stealing from a car or stealing from someone's shed. And it does not, in our opinion, belong uh, on this list. Also of note, larceny from the person is, is uh, sometimes, I would submit, probably frequently used as that step down plea bargain from an assault and robbery um, where someone is injured uh, in a robbery. And then um, this is used as the, uh, the step down plea bargain for conviction. I have a number of other responses to, to ancillary uh, questions that were asked, but they're not on the core topic. So I'm going to stop there because I think we're out of initial time and uh, questions are probably more illuminating than my uh, testimony to begin with. Well, I want, I want to say that <laughs> your testimony is very, is very helpful for us to understand. Um, so um, I'm going to call on Bob first, Kate, because Bob hasn't spoken yet this morning. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Commissioner. How are you doing? Uh, in listening to Attorney Johnson's testimony, I, I might say that when I was reviewing it yesterday, the sales portion piqued my interest also, and I, I inquired about that. Uh, I do agree with the, the shall as far as knowing that we have 14 different counties throughout the state who have 14 different ways of looking at uh, whether this should be law or not. I, I like the judicial review portion of it, but I wanted to get into sealing versus expungement somewhat. And I don't know which one of you would like to answer this. Expungement, uh, for my benefit, and along with those who may be watching, is something that it just, the record just goes away, correct? An expungement, the record is eradicated. And sealing? Sealing, the record is only accessible to those that the legislature has allowed uh, a statute, once you pass it, uh, allows access and under certain circumstances. And sealing a record, Commissioner, means that it could stay uh, out there in, in, in forever, forever land, shall we say? Yes. Uh, though I would observe that it could stay out there forever, uh, but be inaccessible to anyone but, for example, a court, uh, and only under circumstances where there was a reoffense, um, or uh, as I testified to earlier uh, in the session, um, the uh, defendant needs a copy uh, of that record for some reason to uh, illuminate the history of something that's being misrepresented. Let me uh, ask the questions. In reference to uh, the expungement and the records going away, we have uh, BCIC, the Vermont Criminal Information Center, along with NCIC, the National Crime Information Center. Do these records, are, when they're expunged, do they disappear from Vermont's records and also from the federal records, or is it just Vermont's records only that we're looking to expunge? They disappear from both um, because VCIC pulls the record out of the NCIC system. Uh, everything up to and including any fingerprints that were taken um, in concert with that arrest are eradicated from the record. So, so everything is going then, Commissioner? That's correct. So being in law enforcement yourself, how would, if we were, if you were looking at uh, possibly hiring uh, more individuals within law enforcement, if in fact someone's record was sealed and or expunged, we all know that, we, and I asked this question the other day, we all know that uh, there's a, as a mandate now that everyone must uh, must take a polygraph. And I'm not quite sure how they get through their polygraph asking uh, or answering the question as to if you've been involved in a, in a criminal act. And if in fact, uh, the polygraph starts setting off stars here, whatever else, 
how would that affect, because the whole purpose, some of the purpose behind it is to open up jobs for individuals, but if in fact, someone is not doing well on the polygraph and you don't have access or a waiver from that individual to access a sealed record, how do you think that's gonna work in a world of law enforcement per se? I hadn't contemplated that's an excellent question. That would disqualify them from employment. If you can't pass a polygraph and we can't determine what it is that needs to be cleared up as a result of your, your answers, you're not eligible for hire, uh, especially as it relates to criminal conduct. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you get the last question. Thanks, I guess I just had a clarifying question about um, your comments that with expungements, we would never learn the data um, because the expungement record is cleared. And I guess my understanding in researching the issue is that um, index data points are captured on expungements um, specifically for the purposes of maintaining information for research. Am I understanding that correctly? I don't believe so, ma'am. Um, the, there's no way to connect a person to a record once the record's been expunged. Actually, there is no, in Vermont, there is no record. The record is gone. Um, so there would be no way to know if John Smith's record was expunged, whether John Smith ever reoffends and had a prior expungement because the prior expungement is a record that doesn't exist. Chair Grad, is it possible to, can I just check in with Bryn around that quickly? I just saw her can I turn on. Sure. So the effective expungement statute provides that the court has to keep a special index of these cases. And there's only limited data points that can be um, tracked on the special index. And it includes the name of the person, um, their date of birth, the docket number, and the criminal offense. <clears throat> and um, that, so that uh, special index can only be accessed um, by very limited entities. So um, the person themselves, the person who's subject to the record can access it. And also um, for research purposes, um, the chief superior judge can permit special access to those, um, to the special index for research purposes. So thanks for the clarification. It goes to my thesis that this is so complicated that uh, that was not a fragment of information that was uh, provided to me. Um, the, the underlying issue um, is less concerning, but still remains that the details uh, of the prior offense don't exist. So you only know that the person had a disorderly conduct, whether that was pled down from an aggravated assault or a simple assault or something else. Um, you're, you're still flying blind. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioner and, and uh, Attorney Johnson for, for being here this morning and providing your testimony. Uh, and um, we will uh, keep talking. <laughs> So thank you. Meeting. thank you so much for, for staying uh, late into the noon hour. Uh, and uh, so with that, we will adjourn.